Okay, shh. How is everyone today? It's not on. Oh my goodness. Where is it? Oh. So how is everyone today? Good? So we're turning in the first, uh, first written homeworks. Very good. Of course, the, these written homeworks are, are, cover, are covering a uh, lecture from seven days ago, the first lecture. So all of these written homeworks that you've just turned in, their name all starts with zero 01, which signifies that they came from lecture zero 01. All the ones that you'll turn in on Thursday start with zero 02. And that's the convention. If I can get this to back out, that'd be great. Oh, there we go. Uh, so you'll turn in more written homeworks on, thurs uh, on Thursday. And then on Friday, you'll go to problem section, where you'll study problems like these as well as a few others. And then, starting Monday, well, not Monday, because Monday's Labor Day, but I guess Tuesday is the window for the first quiz, which will be over, more or less, the written homeworks that you turned in this week, more or less. Any question about any of that? Well, you have yes? a, a show up quiz that's this window. It's not. The show up quiz was going to be quiz zero, and it was going to be this week. But then the testing center said, no, we're too busy doing something called a CLA exam, and I don't know what that is. But it doesn't matter because they booted us. <laughs> At any rate, yes? So, um, it, is, it is somewhat unlikely that those pages will be graded before your quiz. However, keys, both PDF and video, will be posted. And if it so happens that those can be graded, get graded fast enough, it depends somewhat on the grader, uh, then they'll be posted and available for you to download. Other questions? Okay, so what did we get to last time? Didn't we finish mean value theorem, yeah? Yes. Good. So now we need to talk about the fundamental theorem, and then that'll wrap up all, the, all of the oral exam material, and we can get on to, uh, on to, on to vector calculus. So <coughs> today is the 29th. Okay. So, in the first place, we have this definition of derivative at a point. That is to say, if we have a function f with signature uh, x to reals, with signature x to reals, with x is a subset of the reals, and c is an element of x. Okay, so we've got a function from reals to reals. Uh, <coughs> then the definition of derivative at c is this. The derivative uh, at c is defined as the limit as x goes to c of f of x minus f of c over x minus c. So nothing new here, just reminding you that this is the case. But what I want you to observe is that this is the definition of the derivative of a function at a single point, c. But that is typically, typically not the way you think about derivative, uh, at least not at this level. At this level, you're usually thinking of the derivative as a function in its own right. But I'd like to point out that, that this thing, uh, this definition, is not a function because it's only a definition at a single point. So then if we, so I could say that this is derivative at a point and then remark, construing the derivative as a function, if we have the same setup as before, if it's the same setup as before, that is up here, uh, and the derivative at C exists 
for all c in x. That is to say, if, if this limit exists at all the points that are in there, then you start considering the derivative as a function in its own right. Uh, and we have this new function, f prime, that is now from x to the reals. Okay, but I just want to carefully point out that these are two separate notions. The notion of derivative at a point, and then if this function happens to be differentiable at, at lots and lots of points, for example, all the points, then you can consider the derivative to be a function in its own right. So here is uh, something obvious. Uh, you could have answered this years ago. What is the derivative of, say, um, sine of x? This is just quoting things that you know. This is cosine. Okay. This is cosine of x. Uh, well, what if I, what if I, um, so what I did, what I did is structurally I want you to look at this problem in this way. That there were two boxes, the red box and the green box the red box and the green box, and I had given you the red box and, and requested of you the green box. So now my question is, what, what, what if I, I alternate it and I say, okay, um, still with the, with the boxes, that there's a red box position and a green box position, Uh, what if I put something in the green box and I say like 2x and I say make this, make this, complete this sentence, right? So how, how could you complete this sentence? X squared. x squared, for example. Okay, so x squared. Okay, now a further question, but, but keep in mind that I had given you the green box and not the red box. So I agree entirely that, that Putting x squared in the red box completes the sentence in a, in a correct way. Is that the only way to complete the sentence? No, there's other ways, right? Yeah, I, I could, we could put any, any further constant in there, which is to say that here was the, here was the question. So what can you put in the open spot? You can put x squared plus any constant whatsoever. Okay. So it's a theorem from calculus that, uh, that you can, it, it's obvious that the derivative of x squared is 2x and that the derivative of a constant is zero, but it's slightly less obvious, but something you've already proven in your previous calculus classes, that every single, that there are no others in here, right? You couldn't go out to say some other part of the galaxy where they have better math than we do, okay, and find something else that you could put in there that would give you a 2x. There aren't anything, there's nothing else. Okay, that's it. Okay, <clears throat> so, so, to sort of structurally remind you of the way these things work. So, bear with me while I ask you some sort of trivial questions. If I were to give you, um, if I were to give you this equation, 3y is equal to x, and I requested of you, would you please solve for y? What would you need to do? Okay, divide by 3. So to get y by itself, in a sense, the problem is, is that y is hanging out with that 3 over there. Okay, we've got to get, we've got to separate it from the 3. So uh, visually, the way that occurs is like this. So the, th the 3 changes sides. And when the 3 changes sides, on the left-hand side, it's product. On the right-hand side, it's quotient. Right? That's how it changes. OK. OK. Um, fine. What if I were to give you um, something slightly uh, more complicated, like, um, say, the exponential of y is equal to x? It's not really more complicated. It's just a slightly different notation. Right. So we want to get y by itself. We want to get y by itself. And what happens is, is that the exponential changes sides. And when it changes sides, it becomes logarithm.
a slightly, when looking at it in this way, it's slightly nicer to look at it like this, that this is the exponential of y is x, writing it out, exp. And then to get the exp to move to the other side, it becomes log x on the other side. So when it changes sides, that's how it looks. Right? Multiply by 3 on the left side, divide by 3 on the right. Exponential on the left side, logarithm on the right. Sine on the left side, arc sine on the right. Okay, And all this kind of stuff. So now here's the question. What if, what if, I, I give you uh, d dt of y is x. What if I give you d dt of y is x? And I say, I want you to solve for y. OK, so to get, to get the d dt to switch to the other side, how does it look on the other side? It looks like this. And what I want to point out to you is structurally, it's exactly like all these other things. It's exactly like all these other things, visually. Now, <clears throat> uh, I heard someone say integral. I'm going to, I'm going to um, not agree with that. Okay. So the following are equivalent. TFAE. So. The, the phrase, the following are equivalent, is so common in a math course that it just gets initialized, TFEE. So the following are equivalent, one, that the derivative of big F, some function big F, is little f, okay, and uh, two, the derivative, uh, big F plus any constant is antiderivative of little f dx. So this thing right here, I know that your prior experience, you might have been calling that integral, but really that's an abusive language that's confusing. And if you're saying integral, you might be confused. Okay? So we're going to call this, we're going to call this antiderivative. Antiderivative. So you might. So what I want you to what I want you to see is I'm going to set up a sharp contrast between these two things. There's something called an antiderivative, and there is something called an integral, and they're not the same. They're not the same thing. An antiderivative, an antiderivative, is a a a, a preimage of a derivative. It's the question. It's the answer to the question. Where did I put the thing? An antiderivative is what you can put in this box so that the right thing will come out. Okay, that's what an antiderivative is. <clears throat> so now imagine that we've had a comprehensive review of all the anti-differentiation techniques that you know. So now we have this other thing, this other thing called integral. Okay, so we're going to say let f of x be defined on some interval a to b. Okay, and let x uh, 0, x 1, dot, 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 to x in be a partition, be a partition of a b. That is to say that a is x zero, a is x zero, which is strictly less than x one, which is strictly less than x two, which is strictly less than dot 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 
strictly less than xn, which is the right point. So we've got n plus 1 points, y n plus 1. Because, because we're starting to count at 0. Okay, suppose that we have a partition. <clears throat> and suppose, furthermore, that we have a sampling. of this partition, CI, uh, that is in XI minus 1 to XI. That is to say that what we did is we chopped up, we chopped up the interval A to B into N pieces. We chopped it up into N pieces, and in each one of those pieces, we selected one point CI for every one. So we might have chopped it up into 100 pieces, and then we chose 100 Cs, one in each piece. Okay, such a thing is called a sampling. So presently, uh, the picture sort of looks like this. <clears throat> So I'll say that this is this is uh, a, which is x zero, and then I'll cut it. Now you have to understand I'm drawing a picture. I'd, I'd love to figure out how to draw in uh, such little fence posts, but you know what does that mean? I'm not sure that means anything. So I'm going to draw eight of them, but understand that it means in. Ah, maybe four of them is enough. So this would be x1, x2, x3, and x4, which is b. Okay, and then we have some function that's defined on this interval. Let's say this function. Okay, now I have a question. So the partition... The partition is all of these blue points here. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 points. We broke, we're breaking this region between, the, between the, the, the function and the horizontal axis into four pieces. So we needed five fence posts to get that done. The blue points are the partition. Where are the, where are the sampling points? Yeah, it, well, I mean, are they, are they up here? Where, I mean, here, where are they? Yeah, they're on, they're on the horizontal axis, and how many of them do we have in this picture? Four. We have five partition points, and then between each consecutive pair, we have one sample. So, so there's some, some point, like right here, and maybe we'll call this C1, so C, uh, C1. Uh, maybe we'll pick the middle one for this one, C2. Uh, maybe we'll pick one sort of to the left for this one, C3. And just to make sure that you understand that, it, that it's possible to do so, I'm going to pick the rightmost point for the last one so that this partition point is also a sample point. So it's conceivable that you could be picking the endpoints. So what do we do with these, when we're doing, when we're constructing the integral, what is it that we do with these sample points? We've, yeah? Um, if we find the f of x corresponds to them. Right. And then we can use that plus the distance between the partition points mm -hmm. to create a rectangle. Very good, exactly. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, ah, well, we want to estimate we want to estimate the area that is, that is under this curve, but above the horizontal axis. Now, I'll say the same proviso that your previous calculus, calculus instructor said, and that is to say, well, I drew a, a function that's positive, and I think we can all accept that some functions can be negative. And if the function happened to be negative, we would still construe it as a rectangle, but having a negative area. Okay, so that's all, I hope, just fine. So here we'll go up to right here. That's the height 
this dashed number, or this dashed line that gave me that point right there, that is F of CI, right? That, uh, that's C1, and that's, that height is F of C1. So we're going to make a rectangle that's that tall. Got a rectangle that tall. And then above C2, we're going to make another rectangle. So there's another one. Above C3, another one. Above C4, because I chose the rightmost point, it's there. OK, so then, so then, for example, what I'm saying is that this height right here is F of C3. OK, now, between consecutive partition points, so for example, between X2 and X3, I happen to draw the partition points equally spaced, but there's nothing about what we've said that requires that. Do understand that some of these uh, partition points could be close together, some of them could be far apart. They could, in fact, all be equally spaced. Okay? I'm saying that there's no restriction other than they're increasing strictly. So we're going to call each one of these, we're going to call this one right here delta x, and we're going to call it delta x something what we're going to do is we're going to name it after the right point. So we're going to call this one uh, delta x1. And we're doing that so that the index of the delta x agrees with the index of the sample, right? In this piece, we have c1, and this width is going to be called delta x1. So here, this next one is going to be called what? Delta x2 so that we have delta x2 and c2, okay? Delta x3 and c3, and delta x4 and c4. So yes, I hope we all remember the, the, the game, right? Now we're going to look at these rectangles, these individual uh, four rectangles. What's going to be the area of this rectangle right here? It will be F at C1, that's its height, and then multiplied by delta X1, that's its, its, its base, and the product is, of course, the area of that rectangle. So, so <clears throat> what we're saying is that an approximation for this is F at C1, delta X1, plus F at C2, delta X2, plus F at C2, Three, uh, delta x three plus f at x four delta x four. Was there a question? No, no. Okay. So, so uh, please understand that I drew four pieces, but understand we're talking about n pieces. Yes. No, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> this should be, <laughs> by, by just pure luck, it was, it was still right, but no. <laughs> o only, only right just by accident, because I had accidentally selected C4 as the same as X4. These need to be Cs. Okay. So do understand that generally, we, we've, we've explicitly added four things, but understand that we're that we're talking about adding in things. So generally, it looks like this. The summation from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta xi. So we could, this, this gives us a way to estimate the area under a curve for any number of pieces n. Now, what if we estimated the number of the, the, the area under a curve with, say, 20 pieces, and we came to the conclusion that, that, that our estimate is not good enough? What can we do? More pieces, right? Maybe we could use 21. Okay, or 20 million, for that, for that matter. But the point of view of calculus is that, oh, let's just not stop. 
Let's not use let's not use 20 pieces, 20 million pieces, or 20 trillion pieces. Let's use infinitely many pieces. Let's just go ahead and use infinitely many. What would happen if we did that? So, <clears throat> continuing that previous page, if we define delta x, now note that this is delta x with no, um, with no subscript. If we define delta x with no subscript uh, as the maximum <coughs> over all possible i's of delta xi, so that is to say, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the interval that is biggest, the biggest one. <coughs> Define this. Then, if the limit as delta x goes to 0 of the sum from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta xi, if this converges, con as an n, converges for all partitions and for all samples. So that is to say that it doesn't matter how you partition. You can partition in any way that you see fit with even spacing, uneven spacing, you can sample in any way that you see fit. You can always sample right in the middle. You can sample at a left endpoint, right endpoint. You can sample randomly. If it always converges, no matter how you partition and no matter how you sample, and it always converges to the same value, that is to say that no matter how you partition, no matter how you sample, it converges and it always converges to say five. No matter what, you always get a five. Then, F is integrable on the interval A to B. <clears throat> and the common value that it converges to is denoted, and here we go, the, the, in case you haven't caught on to the, to the oldest joke in calculus, here it is, that the limit as delta x goes to zero of the summation from i is 1 to n of f of ci delta xi is denoted. So I've got a question for you. So that, that letter looks like a triangle. It's not. Well, I mean, it is. But what, uh, what letter is it? Delta, delta right? And then this uh, thing, right? What, what letter is that? Sigma. Sigma, yeah. And, and in fact, what, what, uh, what alphabet do these come from? Greek. They come from Greek. So here's the, hold it, the, 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 the oldest joke in calculus, is that <laughs> when you apply limits, when you apply limits to Greek symbols, what do they become? They become Latin symbols, right? Because, because phonetically, this is sigma. Sigma. And what, phonetically, what, what, what does sigma do in the Greek alphabet? What is S. it? It's S. S, right? And then phonetically, what is delta? D, D, right? So what is the phonetic equivalent of capital sigma? Capital S. And what is the phonetic equivalent of delta? D. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Integral A to B. Yeah, this is just one big joke, in case, you <laughs> in case you haven't caught on, right? Ha ha, you compute limits of Greek symbols, they become Latin symbols. Ha. So 
Let, let's make sure that the joke is clear, right? The definition of derivative can be, re, can be restated in the following way, that the limit as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x, where you're saying that delta y is the change in f, then, then what is the limit of delta, as delta x goes to zero of delta y over delta x? It is dy dx. <laughs> Greek, Latin. <laughs> You'd be, you might be amazed just how many formulas this works out just perfect for because of the long uh, history of mathematicians arranging this joke. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so this common value is called an integral. So I want to point something out. We've talked about two different concepts. We've talked about antiderivative, and doesn't that look like very similar to the notation for antiderivative? However, integral is talking about taking a region, <coughs> chopping it up into rectangles to, to construct an estimate, and then letting the number of rectangles become infinite, be become infinite while the biggest one becomes infinitely fine. Yeah? Uh, on top of the page, what is, when you said the sine of x equals max, uh, what is that saying? The maximum, it's saying the biggest the biggest partition. So like the partition, these, these bits, I happen to draw them all the same size, but they need not be the same size. Some of them could be big, some of them could be little. What I'm saying is that let's call the biggest one delta x. So the requirement is that, is that the biggest one is going to zero, which is, to, which is another way of saying all of them are going to zero. So we're, we're not worried about some case where where one of them is staying very big and then all the others are getting small. Okay, th this condition makes them all get small. So we have these two, these two different notions. Integral means, 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 means taking a region, getting all up in its business, chopping it up into rectangles, okay, measuring very carefully, making a partition, making a sampling, measure, 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 and then computing a sum. That's what integral is. Then we've got antiderivative, which, which is like the Jeopardy question in, in calculus. Who, <laughs> answer, right? Derivative is 2x. Question, <laughs> right? <laughs> that kind of thing. So these two so totally different notions. In fact, historically, it wasn't even clear that these were related, okay? Because you have these different, you had different groups of people separated by, by thousands of miles. And, and decades working on these, two, on these different concepts, and it wasn't even clear that they were related until finally, what? Are they related? Yeah, by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, the fundamental theorem of calculus says the following. So here's the theorem. The fundamental theorem of calculus. So uh, let f from uh, a to b to uh, the reals. Uh, do I want? Do I want f? No, I want I want big f. So this this little f that I just wrote needs to be a big f. Let big F from that interval to the real satisfy the mean value theorem, satisfy the hypotheses of the mean value theorem. <coughs> what does that mean? Yeah, big F has to be continuous on this, on this interval. And, diff and, and big F has to also be differentiable on the open interval. Okay, so those, it, it has those two requirements. So if big F satisfies the hypothesis of the mean value theorem, <clears throat> and furthermore, and the derivative of big F is little f for some other function, so that big F is little f's antiderivative, <clears throat> 
then, then, the integral from a to b of f of x dx is what? It's f evaluated, big F evaluated at b, minus big F evaluated at a. So now, let's back up just a minute, because I'm not sure that you understand just how incredible this is of a thing that this is saying. If this is little f, and we want to make its integral, then in principle, we could cut this into 20 pieces, and we could perform 20 measurements, and make 20 little delta x's, and we can add them all up to get 20 little rectangles, and we might say, that's good, but we want it to be better. So instead of using 20, let's use 100 and get out a spreadsheet and do it. Right? Let's, get, let's make all these measurements in here. Look at all the places we're measuring all over the place, millions and millions of times, okay, to, get, to get a really accurate estimate. You've got to measure everywhere in here. What's the fundamental theorem saying? <laughs> well, it's saying that you don't have to do it. Where do you need to measure, according to the fundamental theorem? Only on the boundary. You don't even need to get inside of it. You can figure it out from the outside. You can measure it just here, just here, and subtract. And there's no need to do anything inside. That's incredible. It's incredible what it's saying. You don't, have to, you don't have to take the machine apart. You don't have to look inside of it. You can just measure it from the outside. So this is a, this is a, a regularity property about it. So here's another example uh, where, where things like this occur. And this is an example of the mean value theorem. So suppose that you're traveling on George Bush Turnpike. And suppose furthermore, I d I'm not saying that this is true, but let's imagine that it's true. Uh, that uh, there's two consecutive gates that are two miles apart, the, the, the thingies where they read your, your tag, that they're two miles apart. Okay, and suppose furthermore uh, that you make it in between those two gates in 60 seconds. So what does that, <laughs> so what does that say? You were able to make it two miles in 60 seconds. So what, what does that say about your speed? Sorry? A average speed is what? 120. Okay, now notice that it says average speed. That's what the mean value theorem says. It says average speed. But, but really the mean value theorem tells you another thing. What is the mean value theorem telling, telling you? It, it's telling you that at at least, one, on average, you were going 120. And it is the case that at least for one instant, when you were going between those gates, you were traveling exactly 120. At least once. You might, have, you might have gone through the first gate going 80 and then really hit it and exited the second gate going 160. Maybe. You know, I don't know. But you were doing it at least once. Okay, so... So this theorem is saying something like that. It's saying that, well, we, we can just measure you at two points, and we know what's happening inside of you. Okay, so now let's, let's, let's prove this. Let's prove this. Okay. And this is one of the things you're going to have to prove. <clears throat> so now, let x0, uh, x1, dot, 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 xn be a partition. Of AB. Let it be a partition. That means that this one is A, that one is B, and they're, they're, they're in increasing order. Okay, so first step. So f of b minus f of a. That's the right-hand side of the fundamental theorem, right? That's the right-hand side of it. Uh, well, just according to our notation, that is also equal to f of xn 
uh, minus f of x zero. Okay, so now I'm gonna do uh, one little trick. I'm gonna say that this is equal to. I'm gonna draw this one in green. So f of x in, so the only difference between this line and the previous line is I'm drawing them in color. And so here we go. So understanding this next thing I'm about to do is, is about half the trick of understanding this proof. So what I'm gonna do what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract big F at x in minus 1. So, so the, 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 the fence post that's next to this one, this one is x in. The one that's right next to it is x in minus 1, the previous one. I'm going to subtract it. But I can't just subtract it because then that would be changing things. So what else must I do? I've got to add it too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this is that this is f of x uh, in, and then I'm going to subtract. Here I need to keep these open now. I'm going to subtract f of x in minus one. And if I just subtracted it, then that 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 would make it not an equation anymore. So now I'm going to add also f of x in minus 1. So you can see I, I added it, or I subtracted it, then I re-added it. So I did nothing. Okay, now I'm going to subtract. I'm going to treat this one just like I treated the one above it. So now what am I going to do with this one? Right, I'm going to subtract. I'm going to subtract f of x in minus 2. But you can't just subtract that. That would, change, that would change it. So what do I have to do? I gotta add it. Okay, so now I'm gonna do this all the way down the line. I'm gonna do it all the way down the line. And the question is, is so what I want you to see is how it stops. Uh, what's, the, what's the last line? What's the, what's, the last, what's the last green F, the last one I'm adding? This would be F of X one, right? Because there's, there's, a, there's a red one right here. And then minus what? Minus F of X zero. Oh, oops, gotta be in red. So what I want you to see, and just, just to kind of help you visually, I'll put this one right here. What I want you to see is that this is what we started with. These are the ones we started with originally. And, they're all, and those two are still there. That one and that one. And then everything else is just a fancy way to, to add and subtract the same value. Okay, any question about this trick? Okay, visually, visually, uh, understanding this trick is like this. If there were, if there were uh, one, two, three, if there were four partition points, uh, sorry, that's five, right? <laughs> if there were five partition points, <laughs> Then we would be uh, subtracting this one, subtracting this one, subtracting this one, subtracting this one, and subtracting this one. Those are all the ones that would, no, not that one. Darn it. That one would not be subtracted. We'd be subtracting all of those, and which ones would we be adding? Yeah, shifted over one. So this one would be added, this one would be added, this one would be added, and this one would be added. So what's going to happen is that all these ones in the middle, they all end up canceling out, and you're just left with the, the two on the edges. Okay, so understanding that trick is half the, half the trick of understanding this proof. 
Okay, so now we pause this trick on pause for a moment. <clears throat> So now consider the interval uh, xi minus 1 to xi, that is to say the ith, the ith interval, <coughs> consider that one, and also consider the difference f of xi minus f of xi minus 1. So that difference is listed on the previous page. It's one of the differences. Well, big F, what's, what must be true about big F? It has to satisfy the mean value theorem, right? Where does big F satisfy the mean value theorem? On the whole interval, right? On A to B. Big F satisfies the interval on the uh, satisfies the mean value theorem on the whole thing, and now I'm talking about some little subinterval. So if if Big F is continuous and differentiable on the big interval, then it's surely continuous and differentiable on a subinterval also. So what I want you to see is that Big F also satisfies the mean value theorem on this interval. So Big F satisfies the mean value theorem on that interval. So what's the conclusion of the mean value theorem? So the, the conclusion, the conclusion we can say is therefore there exists a CI where? In the open version of that interval, right? There is a CI, oops, open, I just got finished saying open. XI minus one, oops, I'm having difficulty right now. To XI, such that what? What condition must big F satisfy? Right. The, the instantaneous rate of change of big F, that is to say, the derivative of big F at CI is the average value, right? The secant, the slope of the secant. So that would be big F at XI minus big F at XI minus 1 over XI minus xi minus 1. But what's the derivative of big F? Don't we have a name for that? Little f, right? According to the hypothesis of the theorem. This, this derivative of big F is little f. And then look, look, at, look at the denominator here, the denominator of this fraction. We have another name for the difference of the consecutive fence posts. What's, what's, what's the name for that one? That's delta xi. Right? So, so uh, therefore, we can say that little f evaluated at ci is big F evaluated at xi minus big F evaluated at xi minus 1 divided by delta xi. But now I'm going to solve, I'm going to solve for that difference by multiplying both sides by delta xi to obtain that f evaluated at ci delta xi is equal to that difference. <coughs> now here's the, here's the second, so this was the third act of the theorem. So the first act of the theorem was to say that the right hand side of the fundamental theorem can be expressed as the sum of a whole bunch of differences, right? This difference plus that difference plus that difference all the way down the line, okay? Then the second act was to say 
And all of those differences can be represented like that because big F satisfies the mean value theorem. So that means that F of B minus F of A, big F at A, is actually can be written as F at CN uh, delta XN plus F at CN minus 1 delta XN minus 1 plus dot 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 plus F at C1 C1 delta X1 but the, don't we have a nice notation for adding up all those things we've got the sigma notation right so this is the sum from i is 1 to n of f at ci delta xi. And now here's the trick, is that because, because, uh, because f satisfies the hypothesis of the mean value theorem, that means that it's, it is integrable. And we started this out by saying, give me any partition that you like. Give me whatever partition you like. From this, we produce the sampling. How did we produce the sampling? By invoking the mean value theorem n times. We said, OK, in this region, we invoke the mean value theorem to produce that sample point. And the next one, we invoke the mean value theorem again to produce that sample point, et cetera. So this, this is a Riemann sum. And because this, because this was uh, arbitrary, because this was arbitrary, we can say that this is therefore equal to also the limit as delta x, meaning the biggest one, goes to zero. Because we arranged, we arranged the right-hand side of the fundamental theorem to be exactly equal to this sum, so we can make it exactly equal to any of these sums. But what's the limit? That's the integral. And that's the proof. Incredible. The proof of the fundamental theorem in three acts. Yes? Um, I'm actually a little unfamiliar with the, uh, the, the, the delta x going to zero and just like n going to infinity, but like the, do they, they do the same thing. Like they, they don't necessarily do the same thing. When you, when you so in your pre, pre, previous experience, when this was written as, as n goes to infinity, then that works when the partition is uniform, which is to say that all the partitions are equally spaced. It, it doesn't matter for the sampling then. So the, the problem is, is that you could do something, so let, let's clear it up with, with an example. Is, is you could say, I could say, here's the, oops, here's the partition, right? So we have a partition with, with, with three points, and then you say, okay, now let the number of partition points become infinite. So I'll add one here. And then you say, that's not enough, okay, I'll add one here. And you say, that's not enough. OK, I'll add one here. Oh, that's not enough. I'll add one here. So do you observe that there's always room for me to add one more right there. This one remains too big. So that's the problem, is that, is that if you don't have what, you, what must occur is that the biggest one, the biggest one has to go to 0, which forces all of them to go to 0. Is that happening by your, you're saying just kind of implicitly that you're adding more, but the bigger one has to go to zero? Because right. How do you shrink them if they're not adding? Right. Yeah, you have to be adding more okay. in, in any way that you choose. Okay. But I'm just making the requirement that you, you give me the partition, but it has to be at least this fine. That's the cheat one, the root yeah, otherwise, otherwise you could be cheated. Yes? Why were we able to add the limit of the self Because. So your, the question is about this step right, right here, I think. So what I, the reason is, is because the partition was arbitrary. Because we were able to arrange that the right-hand side of the fundamental theorem is exactly equal to this sum. 
So that means that we could do it if the partition had 100 pieces or 100 million pieces or a billion pieces. It doesn't matter how many pieces the partition has. We can always arrange it so that the right-hand side of the fundamental theorem is exactly equal to this finite sum. And because we can always make it for any n, then we can also compute the limit as the number of pieces becomes infinite. That's why. Incredible theorem. It's an incredible theorem. To say that, to, 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 to compute an integral, you have to evaluate a function on an interval at infinitely many points. Unless, unless it satisfies the fundamental theorem, then you can just do it at two. Wow, incredible. So what we're gonna do by the end of the course is we're going to say, okay, we wanna compute integrals, say, uh, inside of a sphere. We wanna compute some integral inside of a sphere, like say, inside of the Earth. Well, I think we can all accept and agree that some positions inside of the Earth are not physically accessible to us can't get there. You just can't get there, right? Can't get to it. Does that mean that we wouldn't be able to calculate an integral that, that was over the entire interior of the Earth? No. We can because instead of computing an integral in the interior, we can compute an integral on its boundary, on the surface, the part that we do have access to. And we can figure out what's going on inside of the Earth by only measuring the outside. Just like a physician can, can tell what's going on inside of you with a thermometer, right? We, we don't need to cut you open today, right? No need to get out the knife. Let's start with a thermometer, okay? Because all of us work more or less the same inside. Good. Any question about this? So we're gonna build up to a, to a theorem where we can say we can change measurements for the out, on the outside for measurements on the inside or vice versa. That's the big thing we're going toward. Okay, good. I have a sheet. So here we are, finally starting uh, multivariable calculus. So definition. An element of Rn is a list, is an ordered list ordered list of n numbers in reals x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. So like R2 is an ordered list of two numbers, x1 and x2, etc. So now, uh, a remark about notation is that elements uh, in Rn are called vectors, vectors, and depending on the context, they have at least two different interpretations. So when you interpret an element x with, uh, let's write that big so that everyone can see how to write that. So that's an x with an arrow over it and it has a half hook, which means that it's a bar and then a half hook that way. So that's how you draw a vector. So you, when you interpret x like that in Rn as a position, then the way you write this is with round parentheses. So x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. And notably, it is a column. It's vertical. So 
For example, when we're talking about a position like, say, this one, you could write this as something like, if, if this happened to be true, uh, it could be 3, 5. That means that in the first coordinate direction, you have to travel 3, and in the second coordinate direction, you have to travel 5. Uh, 2, when you interpret it, x as an increment, as an increment, that is to say, so I could, we, we could, is the difference between a position and an increment is to say, well, we could draw coordinate lines on the floor here. And then I could go to a certain point and I could say, I am standing at, and I could read my point, my position, 3, 5. I'm standing at 3, 5. An increment is, to, is, is the way I can say, I'm pointing to a place that is uh, two, 2, 1 in the one direction and 7 in the other direction that way. That's an increment. Okay, so it's saying from somewhere. When you're interpreting it as an increment, the notation that we'll use is square parentheses. So of course, the proper name for, for these is not square parentheses. What's the proper name for them? Brackets, right? But a lot of people, in my experience, typically have difficulty remembering that these are called parentheses and these ones are called brackets. Okay, so I'll call them square parentheses. And then the curly parentheses, like that you use for sets, what are they called? Braces. They're called, that's their name, braces, but no one can remember that either. Okay, whatever. So, so that is to say, if you had, if you had, uh, say, two positions, these could be anywhere, and you wanted to say that, well, to get from that point to that point, oops, I missed it, so let's draw it again. To get from that point to that point, we'll refer to this increment as something like, if I, you know, I don't know, 5, 2. Now, do understand, do understand that if I were to move this arrow to another position rigidly, without twisting it or stretching it or anything like that, like if I was to just pull it down, then what would it be? It'd be 5, 2. What if I moved it way over here? It'd still be 5, 2. Because, because construing it as an increment is just saying how to get from one point to another. Good. Any question about that? I say that because otherwise you might get confused. Why am I switching between parentheses and brackets all the time? Yes? Oh, um, but if you move the, the parentheses, it would change the number to move it position. Right. If, if we were to move this point around, then the numbers inside of the round parentheses would move. I'm sorry? Okay. Good. So now, all of you had to take linear algebra before you got here. Uh, so this is just a reminder of what a subspace is. So a set, V, which is a subset of Rn, is called a subspace when two conditions. So uh, two things have to be true about this subset uh, V. The first requirement is what? Okay, so let me write the one I think you're saying. So you're saying uh, K, so K V is an element of V for all K in the reals and all V in V. That is to say, if you were to take, if you take anything in V, any element at all that happens to be in V, you can multiply it by any real number that you want, and it's still in V. It's still in there. So what's the name for this property? 
Ah, uh, what's its name? I mean, I mean, I agree. It's a homogeneity. This is this is the homogeneity property. Neity. So, you you have to have homogeneity. What's the other property that you must have? Yes, that u plus v must be an element of v for all u and v in space of v. What's this one called? Starts with A. Additivity. So any, it, it, it's possible to have spaces which are, which are uh, to, to have things that are homogeneous. It's possible to have things that are additive. Okay, but you, only when you're homogeneous and additive, only when you have both, is it the case uh, that um, it's a subspace. Yes? Uh, what is the difference between uh, when you write the C for the subset and the C underlined for the subset? This? Yes. Uh, well, that's just a matter of notation. So if I want to, if I want to say strict subset, the notation that I'll use is less than, not equal. That would, mean, that would mean a strict subset, in the sense that, for example, the naturals are a strict subset of the reals. But the reals are a subset of the reals. Yes? Uh, we also call those closure over multiplication and closure over uh, You can, but it's, it's useful to know these names because these are the names that get used elsewhere. So this is the homogeneity property and this is the additivity property. So when you, have, when, when you have something that is both homogeneous and additive, taking those together, then that's such a special situation that it has its own name when something is both homogeneous and additive. What is it called? A subspace. A subspace, for one thing. <laughs> yeah, I love it, okay. But I'm, I'm fishing for, for a word that starts with L. Linear. It's called a linear space. Okay, so when you have things that are, that you, when you have homogeneity and additivity, that's linear. Okay. So would it be correct to call a subspace a subset, which is linear? Yes. Well, you have to be careful, <laughs> you have to be careful about linear because that means, because in that, in that, to say it that way is to say homogeneous and additive. Okay. So, so what this means, taking those together, visually, for those of you who are visual folks, uh, this means that it is a flat space and it goes through the origin. So if on the, on the plane, say, on the plane, you, every subspace, every, every proper subspace of the plane is a line that goes through the origin. So that's a subspace. A flat thing, flat, which means that no bendy. And it must go through the origin. Now here's something that's flat. This is flat. Is that a subspace? No. Why not? Doesn't go through the origin. This uh, doesn't satisfy the homogeneity property because, for example, if you were to take this point, this increment right here, taking that point right there, then you ought to, if, if this red was a linear space, a subspace, then you ought to be able to multiply this green vector by half and it would still be a red point. But where is, where, where does that vector, the green vector point, if you multiply it by half? Yeah, it would point right here which is not a red point, okay? That's, that's why you've got to go through the origin. Okay, good. Next. <clears throat> Definition of a field. So one, 
a vector field is a function uh, with signature Rn to Rn. Okay, and for our purposes, we need to have that n is a natural that's more than one. Okay, so so such so such a thing is a vector field. Okay, a scalar field is a function. R n to R. So notice that this is R, that the, that the output is a scalar. So, you know, th this kind of goes on, this kind of terminology goes on. So the inputs are these vectors, and when the output is a, another vector of the same number of elements, such a thing is called a vector field. When the input is a vector and the output is a scalar such a thing as a scalar field? And if the input was a vector and the output was strawberries, then it would be a strawberry, strawberry field. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> so, so uh, such an example. Uh, the simplest possible example would be something like this. So f of x and y, we could say is uh, how about one and a half? So in the same way that in scalar calculus, that's in, in some sense the simplest functions are the constant functions, this is a really simple function. Okay, a, a, a function whose output is a constant. So how would you plot such a function? So, I'll give myself some grid lines here. So what's happening is that at every point, at every point, we're going to draw a vector that goes, that goes one to the right and half up. So from the origin, we'll go one to the right and half up. A little vector is, is right there. Where we will we go from here? One to the right and half up. Okay, where will we go from here? Oh, oh really, okay, one to the right and half up. Okay, so we'll, we'll do that everywhere, right? So this is, a, this is a, a function that looks like this. So now, I agree that this is sort of really simple. We're gonna end up getting to some more interesting ones later, but we need to start out with something simple. An example of this would be like if you were standing out in the middle of Kansas, really flat, and there was just a constant breeze just blowing in that direction. Or if you were out in the middle of the Atlantic and you were just barely had an ocean current and it was just all going that way. Okay, So locally, locally, wind and water and things like that can be approximated by constant functions as so long as they're differentiable there whatever that's going to mean we're going to have to talk about that okay so that's all for today uh see you on thursday